Dear friends, we continue our reading classes. Today we'll read a short story by a famous English writer, Somerset Maugham, The Ant and the Grasshopper. This story is a striking example of life's irony, when honesty, wisdom and industry are not always paid properly in our modern world. The Ant and the Grasshopper by Somerset Maugham When I was a very small boy, I was made to learn by heart certain of the fables of La Fontaine, and the moral of each was carefully explained to me. Among those I learned was the ant and the grasshopper, which is devised to bring home to the young the useful lesson, that in an imperfect world, industry is rewarded and giddiness punished. In this admirable fable, the ant spends a laborious summer gathering its winter store, while the grasshopper sits on a blade of grass, singing to the sun. Winter comes, and the ant is comfortably provided for, but the grasshopper has an empty larder. He goes to the ant and begs for a little food. Then the ant gives him her classic answer. What were you doing in the summertime? Saving your presents, I sang. I sang all day, all night. You sang? Why? Then go and dance. I could not help thinking of this fable when the other day I saw George Ramsey lunching by himself in a restaurant. I never saw anyone wear an expression of such deep gloom. He was staring into space. He looked as though the burden of the whole world sat on his shoulders. I was sorry for him. I suspected at once that his unfortunate brother had been causing trouble again. Is it Tom again? I asked. He sighed. Yes, it's Tom again. I suppose every family has a black sheep. Tom had been a sore trial for 20 years. He had begun life decently enough. He went into business, married and had two children. The Ramses were perfectly respectable people, and there was every reason to suppose that Tom Ramsey would have a useful and honorable career. But one day, without warning, he announced that he didn't like work and that he wasn't suited for marriage. He wanted to enjoy himself. He left his wife and his office. He had a little money and he spent two happy years in the various capitals of Europe. Rumors of his doings reached his relations from time to time. They shook their heads and asked what would happen when his money was spent. They soon found out he borrowed. For this he depended on his brother George. George was a serious and respectable man. Once or twice he fell to Tom's promises of amendment and gave him considerable sums in order that he might make a fresh start. On this Tom bought a motor car and some very nice jewelry. But when circumstances forced George to realize that his brother would never settle down, and he washed his hands of him, Tom, without a qualm, began to blackmail him. And George paid. For twenty years Tom raced and gambled, philandered with the prettiest girls, danced, ate in the most expensive restaurants, and dressed beautifully. He always looked as if he had just stepped out of a bandbox, Though he was 46, you would never have taken him for more than 35. He was the most amusing companion, and though you knew he was perfectly worthless, you could not but enjoy his society. He had high spirits, an unfalling gaiety, and incredible charm. Poor George, only a year older than his scapegrace brother, looked 60. He had never taken more than a fortnight's holiday in the year for a quarter of a century. He was in his office every morning at 9.30 and never left it till 6. He was honest, industrious and worthy. He had a good wife to whom he had never been unfaithful even in thought and four daughters to whom he was the best of fathers.
He made a point of saving a third of his income, and his plan was to retire at 55 to a little house in the country where he proposed to cultivate his garden and play golf. Poor George! I sympathized with him. I wondered now, as I sat down beside him, what infamous thing Tom had done. George was evidently very much upset. Do you know what's happened now? he asked me. I was prepared for the worst. You are not going to deny that all my life I have been hardworking, decent, respectable and straightforward. And you can't deny that Tom has been idle, worthless and dishonorable. George grew red in the face. A few weeks ago he became engaged to a woman old enough to be his mother, and now she's died and left him everything she had. Half a million pounds, a yacht, a house in London, and a house in the country. George Ramsey beat his clenched fist on the table. It's not fair, I tell you, it's not fair. I could not help it. I burst into a shout of laughter as I looked at George's wrathful face. I rolled in my chair. I very nearly fell on the floor. George never forgave me. But Tom often asked me to excellent dinners in his charming house in Mayfair. And if he occasionally borrows a trifle from me, that is merely from force of habit. It is never more than a sovereign. You may find many other short stories and novels by this outstanding writer in Chizhevsky Library. You are welcome.